Today, college students and the rest of us are told that humans descended from a long line of animal ancestors all the way back to the first one-celled protozoa. That there are no longer any missing links in the human evolution story because hundreds of fossils for hundreds of intermediate human ancestors have been found and continue to be found. The fossil evidence for human evolution is the most complete sequence with no gaps and no lack of transitional forms, a clean example of Darwinian gradualistic evolutionary change. And we are told that this is the scientific explanation. People have been taught to associate science with observation and evidence, and this is appropriate. However, on some topics, people are confidently assured that there is lots of evidence, but not having time or the expertise to process huge amounts of material, they simply trust that claim. Zealous evolutionists who are not experts in paleontology and human origins may claim that there are mountains of evidence, no missing links, and hundreds of ancestors. But dig a little deeper, and you will find those claims really belong somewhere between wishful thinking and false advertising. Rather than hundreds, there's only around 20 specific alleged ancestors, and according to the experts, most of them are doubtful. Here they are, in the order they were discovered. In 1837, some remains were found that were later called Pliopithecus. In 1856, the first Neanderthal remains were found in Germany. Oreopithecus was discovered in 1872. In the 1890s, a Dutch military officer, Eugene Dubois, found a human-like femur and an ape-like skull cap, which he claimed to be from a human ancestor that came to be known as Java Man and Homo erectus. In 1912, a skull was found in an English gravel pit that was labeled Piltdown Man, and many were excited to think that they had found the first Englishman. In 1921, the remains of what was claimed to be Peking Man were found not far from Beijing. In 1922, western Nebraska yielded what was hailed as evidence of early man in North America, Nebraska Man and was cited as evidence for evolution at the 1925 Scopes trial. In 1924, Raymond Dart found the first remains of what was labeled Australopithecus africanus. In 1927, Louis Leakey found Proconsul, and it received a lot of attention as a potential human ancestor. In 1932, the first remains of Ramapithecus, a portion of the jaws, were found in northern India, and these were thought by many to be an important early human ancestor. In 1938, the first fossils of Paranthropus were found in South Africa and noted by Robert Broom. In 1959, Mary Leakey found very similar fossils in East Africa and named them Zinjanthropus, which received more press coverage because of the Leakey name. These were all later classified as another form of Australopithecus. In 1948, Dryopithecus was discovered by Lewis and Mary Leakey. In 1964, Homo habilis was discovered, a possible early human that appeared to have used tools. In 1973, Donald Johansson discovered Australopithecus afarensis, nicknamed Lucy, which became his claim to fame and he has continued to promote it as the most important human ancestor. In 1994, Australopithecus ramidus. 1995, Australopithecus anamensis. 2001, Kenyanthropus platyops. 2002, Sahelanthropus tacadensis. 2003, Homo floriensis, or the hobbits. 2008, Australopithecus sediba. In 2009, Darwinius macellae, or Ida. In 2015, Homo naledi was found deep in a very hard to reach cave. 
These 23 alleged human ancestors are a long way from Ayala's claim that there are hundreds of intermediate transitional forms, but are all of these really worthy of consideration? And we can tidy up the chart a little by eliminating three characters that never should have been included to begin with. Although it fooled a good number of wishful thinking experts for 40 years, chemical tests in 1953 revealed Piltdown Man to have been an outright fraud. A human skull was paired with an orangutan's jaw that was filed down to make them appear to fit together, and the whole thing was chemically stained to make them look older. The single tooth that was the basis of Nebraska Man, portrayed in imaginative artwork, came from an extinct pig. What's wrong with you people? As for little Ida, while some eager promoters even called this fossil a little girl, others quickly rejected it as related to lemurs and lorises. All right, let's dress up that line. Many people blindly trust anything labeled science. They embrace the propaganda and believe that science has proven that humans evolved from an ape-like common ancestor shared with the great apes, and that there is a complete and clear line of intermediate transitional ancestral fossil forms linking modern humans back to that common ancestor. Well, that's the fairy tale version that secularists want people to believe, in the Doubting Darwin intro video, we noted that when Greek philosophers, 2600 years ago, rejected the distorted supernaturalism of Homer's gods on Mount Olympus, they embraced an optimistic philosophy of materialistic naturalism, and then imagined simple life began in the sea, slowly developed new forms, crawled onto land, and humans later arose from some earlier animal form. So, when later European intellectuals had enough of the distorted supernaturalism of Christendom, beginning in the later 1600s, they did the same thing. They rejected the supernatural, embraced an optimistic materialistic naturalism, and began imagining almost identical stories. Simple life began in the sea, slowly developed new forms, crawled onto land, and humans later arose from some earlier animal form. Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species by Natural Selection in 1859, asserting that protozoa were gradually transformed into all of the later major groups, like a great tree of life. It was only four years later, 1863, that a predictable scenario for humans evolving from animal ancestors, probably the great apes, by Darwinian processes, were published by T. H. Huxley and Charles Lyell. In 1871, Charles Darwin published his version of the story, The Descent of Man. However, like the earlier Greek version, this also was philosophical fiction. For Huxley, Lyle, and Darwin had no hard evidence to support their newer version of the same story. Despite their growing faith in the evolution of man, they had so little fossil evidence to go on, that their theories were, of necessity, largely speculative. Darwin, in fact, wrote his epochal, The Descent of Man, without a single subhuman fossil, as evidence to support his theory. For the evolutionists, this was a painful time. For all the logic of T. H. Huxley's view, there was an embarrassing lack of fossils, resembling men, in Africa, or anywhere else, to support it. When Darwin's book was published, there was only one suspected fragment, of this nature, known in the entire world. In case you're wondering about the three cheerleaders we cited earlier, claiming there was so much evidence for the human evolution story, no missing links, hundreds of intermediate forms, complete without any gaps, well those guys are not recognized experts in paleontology or human origins, but are professors of psychiatry, genetics, and cultural anthropology. 
They were confidently promoting the standard mythology, but their rosy portrayals bear little resemblance to what the real experts have been saying about this whole story for decades. Well, since evidence has been scanty, artwork has been the principal vehicle for promoting the imagined human evolution story and for their own recognition, every expert has an incentive to come up with their own particular version of the story, which they then promote in chart form to the public. We could refer to this as the evolution of evolution charts. The real test for any of these alleged human ancestors is how many of the recognized experts accept them as a human ancestor, include them in their charts, and how long they remain on those charts. Let's see how well the 20 have done in this regard. One of the most influential charts was the 1968 Calvin Zallinger chart, which appeared as a centerfold in the Time Life book Early Man. It visually portrayed the imagined gradual transformation from small ape to modern human, but the text on the chart and the surrounding text in the book admitted that two-thirds of the characters present were not really believed to be human ancestors when it was published. We will come back and focus on this chart a little later. Richard Leakey's chart, published nine years later by Time magazine in November 1977, was stripped down to only three alleged ancestors. Thirteen years after the 1968 Calvin Salinger chart was published, Donald Johansson, an ardent promoter of the Australopithecines, published a chart in his 1981 book, Lucy. But like Richard Leakey, he had trimmed the Calvin Salinger chart's 14 characters down to only four ancestors. Ramapithecus had already been found to have been an orangutan and should have been omitted, but even so, he only identified four ancestors. The Swisher Curtis chart, published in Time magazine March 1994, was back up to seven ancestors. A year later, in 1995, the Grolier Encyclopedia claimed six ancestors, although two were the fully human Steinheim and Cro-Magnon men. Ten years later, 2005, Britannica published a chart with only four alleged ancestors. Well, these charts appeared in books, encyclopedias, and major news magazines between 1968 and 2005. For each chart, I began with only the potential ancestors known at that time, but it is still obvious that all but the Calvin Salinger chart, which included everything but the kitchen sink, claimed less than half of those available. Several included known Homo sapiens as fillers because there just were not many good candidates. Why were so many of these characters, independently promoted to the public as possible ancestors when discovered, later not included in many, if any, of these charts? Actually, it's fairly simple. Most of the experts do not believe these really were human ancestors, or have absolutely no idea where to place them in the lineup. It was the Calvin Zallinger chart that drew me into a serious consideration of the Darwinian story. This fold-out chart was published in the 1968 Time Life book, Early Man, 
claiming to show the stages of man's long march from ape-like ancestors to sapiens in 15 incremental steps. This chart was placed on many college office and classroom walls and was prominently displayed in the background of one scene from the 1990s movie, Congo. It unofficially migrated from my dad's library into mine. While the chart visually portrayed the popularly imagined notion of a small ape evolving into modern man in 15 incremental stages, the small print under the characters on the chart and surrounding text in the book admitted that a large number of the characters were not really believed to be ancestors of Homo sapiens when it was published. The small print below Pliopithecus denies that it is a human ancestor, saying it was ancestral to the Gibbons. The text below Proconsul claims that it was an early ape, ancestral to chimps and perhaps gorillas. In the surrounding text, Howell admitted that Dryopithecus was probably ancestral to the Gibbons. Howell said that Oreopithecus was clearly an aberrant ape, not a human ancestor. Ramapithecus was the first character on the chart that was thought to be a possible human ancestor when the book was published. The Australopithecines were also thought by many to be human ancestors at that time. The small print below Paranthropus declares it to have been a dead end, not a human ancestor. Homo erectus is usually associated with Java man and Peking man, so it was thought to be a human ancestor when the chart was published. Characters 10 through 14 were all considered to be Homo sapiens when the chart was published, so they are not ancestors of Homo sapiens. The published chart contained 15 characters to visually promote the imagined mythology of human evolution from an ape-like common ancestor. However, the text on the chart and in the book admitted that only four of those characters were really believed to be human ancestors when it was published. Between 1863 and 1871, Huxley, Lyle, and Darwin put forward the story of an ape-like common ancestor evolving into modern humans without any evidence to support the story. A hundred years after their books, the Calvin Salinger chart was published to visually promote the same scenario, but two-thirds of the characters in that lineup were admitted in the text of the book to not really be ancestors of modern humans when published. So of those actually believed to be human ancestors when the chart was published, how many of them have survived further scrutiny in the years that followed? Well, doubts were raised about Ramapithecus in the 1960s, and discovery of a complete jaw revealed it to have been an orangutan. During the 1970s, a number of articles were published declaring that Ramapithecus was not a human ancestor, and most later charts have excluded it. A number of noted experts have rejected the Australopithecines as having anything to do with the human lineage. They are excluded on many later charts, so they at least deserve a question mark. As for Homo erectus, Dubois withdrew his doubtful evidence for Java Man 60 years earlier. Later researchers doubted that Peking Man was a human ancestor and all of the evidence for it disappeared during World War II. So while Homo erectus simply means upright man, there are good reasons to be suspicious of Java and Peking man. That doesn't leave much. Ah, oh, this is weak, man. Well, the chart claimed to present the stages by which humans had evolved from an ape-like common ancestor. However, when I finished my original study of this chart years ago, I shared it with my dad a biology department head at a state college in Michigan, and his response was that he had always been a little skeptical of the human evolution notion. Well, I was disgusted and became a lot more skeptical of how truly scientific the rest of the Enlightenment's evolution stories were.
Traditionally, science has been based on observation and following evidence wherever it leads. But what do you do when you have a story, like the Bible, that you want to discredit and need a new story to contradict and replace it, but you have little or no evidence for any other story? The men of the European Enlightenment were committed to discrediting the biblical view of human origins, assumed that humans evolving from a common ancestor with the great apes was the most plausible alternative, and placed a great deal of faith in evidence they hoped would eventually be found. As we've seen, between 1863 and 1871, T.H. Huxley, Charles Lyell, and Charles Darwin imagined and published fictional stories for that scenario. I call them fictional because it's been admitted that they had no fossil evidence upon which to base their stories. However, secular intellectuals embraced the new story quickly and have firmly held on to it ever since as the only possible explanation since it excludes God contradicts Genesis, logically follows upon Darwin's larger story, and is portrayed as based in reason, science, and evidence. We have also noted that a century later, Time Life books promoted the same story with the Calvin Zallinger chart visually portraying the imagined scenario they want people to believe, a small ape slowly transformed into modern humans in 15 incremental steps. Although associated text admitted that only four of those characters were really considered human ancestors when published, a picture is worth a thousand words. The artwork portrayed the imagined notion. It was promoted as science, and they knew that many would buy the idea without bothering to read or grapple with the disclaimers in the text. Evolutionists believe the line that led to modern humans diverged from the great apes with some unknown common ancestor around 8 million years ago. However, an article in the November 7, 1977 Time magazine admitted that there were virtually no fossils for the first 3 million years, and in 1996 Donald Johansson admitted that there are only a handful of undiagnostic fossils from the last 4 million years. Most of the fossils lead to endless speculation and storytelling, but they're just fragments and scraps of jaws and skulls. After a century, the fossil record is maddeningly sparse. With so few clues, a single bone can upset everything, put deep cracks in the conventional wisdom, and force scientists to concoct new theories amid furious debate. The fossil evidence is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. It is so empty that it is difficult to place new discoveries in an evolutionary sequence leading to modern humans. The earliest examples of Homo are separated from the Australopithecines by a large gap devoid of any intermediate fossil forms. There aren't any fossils that fill in the missing links. There aren't any fossils to document when the genus Homo emerged. The crucial transition from Australopithecus to Homo is critical, but obscure because there just isn't much fossil evidence for it. A few decades ago, all of the alleged fossils for human ancestors could fit in a desk drawer. Some chapters of the human evolution story are completely unknown from the fossil record, while others are based on evidence so scanty that the story is little more than speculation. As early as 1972, experts have been admitting that they really cannot agree on the relationship and arrangement of the fossils that they do have. Doubts about the sequence of ancestors remain. Which fossils were and were not human ancestors is hotly debated, and every year some fossil is found older than experts expected. In April 1981, Walter Cronkite invited Richard Leakey to appear with Donald Johansson to discuss their conflicting views. Leakey was promised that he would not be put on the spot to endorse any particular view of the path from apes to humans. But on camera, Johansson forced the issue by holding up a chart with his view of the family tree with space for Leakey to draw his view. Leakey hesitated but then made his point by crossing out Johansson's view 
And when Johansson asked what his view of the human family tree would be, Leakey just wrote a big question mark. In 1984, Mary Leakey said that after decades of research, we really know very little about human origins. And she expressed her doubts that a clear link could be established between apes and humans. In 1990, experts again admitted that there was no consensus on how to arrange the alleged ancestors leading to modern humans. The longer they ponder the fossils, the more confusing the story becomes, with many unanswered questions about when and where modern humans appeared. In 1995, Richard Lewontin expressed his doubt that any fossil hominid species could be identified as our direct ancestor. In 2014, an article in the Scientific American admitted that genetic and fossil evidence was making it even more difficult to identify direct ancestors for modern humans than anyone expected 20 years earlier. And in 2021, the American Museum of Natural History admitted that the story about human origins is just a big mess with no consensus amongst experts. Another evolution cheerleader, Richard Dawkins, well known as an atheistic biologist, but not recognized as an expert on fossils or human origins, has asserted that every fossil ever found fits perfectly into the evolutionary narrative. All the fossils that we have ever found, have always been found in the appropriate place, in the time sequence. There are no fossils in the wrong place. Well that's not what F. Clark Howell said in the 1968 book Early Man. He noted two fossils that have bothered paleontologists for a long time, because they appear to be modern human skulls prior to Neanderthals. Two skulls. Both were discovered in the 1930s and they have been bothering paleoanthropologists ever since. Swanscombe and Steinheim. What is so bothersome about it is their proportions, and particularly, their curves are much the same as modern man's. They are definitely not those of Homo erectus. This is absolutely astonishing. What on earth was a modern looking skull, like that, doing way back there? There is no good answer to the question for it seems to indicate a kind of precocious modern man, sneaking into the picture, along with, or even before, Neanderthal man. Concerning Neanderthals, Howell also noted that those fossils display a strange pattern. Over time they appeared to have been degenerating, rather than evolving upwardly towards modern humans. After years of fieldwork, Louis Leakey came to question if alleged human ancestors could be arranged in a sequence leading to modern humans. And then his son, Richard Leakey, in 1972, found skull 1470, and the rounded skull cap looks surprisingly like a modern human, showing up in the fossil record long before Homo erectus. In 1979, Lewis's wife and Richard's mother, Mary Leakey, discovered very human-like footprints in volcanic ash dated at 3.6 million years old. She noted that the imprints looked like modern human feet. Footprints that are remarkably similar to those of modern man. The form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. Leg structure must have been very similar to our own. In 2013, five different skulls were found in a cave in southern Russia. However, it appears that what were assumed to be a series of steps in human evolution were actually contemporary varieties that were living side by side. If you're wondering what the current state of the theory looks like, the collected evidence has only produced confusion, so that the experts appear to be divided into three distinct groups. 
There are those who follow Raymond Dart and Donald Johansson and believe that the Australopithecines, especially Lucy, are the main characters linking apes and humans. And some charts portray this path. Then there is a group that rejects the Australopithecines as having anything to do with human evolution. So the charts based on this view have the Australopithecines in a side branch leading to some type of ape. Finally, there is a group which includes the Leakeys, Richard Lewontin and Henry G, that has concluded that the evidence is so confusing and the time span between fossils so vast that there is no way that anyone can identify a clear path of development linking apes and humans. Another sign of the growing level of uncertainty about a discernible line of ancestors linking apes and humans is demonstrated in the accumulating charts used to promote the notion. Early promoters confidently imagined the larger evolution story from early marine life to modern humans. There was a tendency to portray human evolution in terms of different lineups in which all or most of the characters were portrayed with similar upright human-like bodies and different ape-like heads walking in the same direction suggesting evolutionary movement. Then, along with the lineups, charts began adding separate sections in which bars portrayed when each character lived without any connections between them. As confusion increased about an actual discernible line of ancestors and descendants, later charts had characters walking on different bars or just portrayed as parallel but disconnected bars for when each lived. Some charts continue to portray the imagined story, with ink lines or arrows linking imagined ancestors and descendants. But others more honestly express the growing uncertainty about ancestral links between characters with open space. Question marks or breaks in the branches. The amount of imagination and wishful thinking that has gone into this story is rather amazing. Between 1863 and 1871, Huxley, Lyle, and Darwin published stories of human evolution without citing any fossil evidence. Piltdown Man was an intentional fraud, a human skull and an altered orangutan's jaw, but it suckered most of the evidence-starved British science establishment for 40 years. All of the artwork for Nebraska Man was imagined from a single extinct pig's tooth. The Zenjanthropus skull, given to three artists, produced three very different portrayals. National Geographic provided several artists with a handful of bone fragments, no skull or even bones for major limbs, but each of them imagined different artwork ancestors with bodies and heads. Those deeply committed to the belief that an ape-like creature was gradually transformed into modern humans will continue to keep the faith when evidence is non-existent, fraudulent, or questionable, because they really want this story to be true. Accordingly, Artwork depicting anything between apes and humans is acceptable for promoting the story. On the other hand, we've seen big names like the Leakeys, Richard Lewontin, and Henry G. express their doubts, while the 2021 statement from the American Museum of Natural History admitted the story on human origins is just a big mess lacking expert consensus. While committed secularists will never consider another possibility, because avoiding the God story has long been their primary concern, as I became aware of how truly unscientific this whole scenario was, it eventually occurred to me that there might be a simple answer to all of this. 
Could it be that the expected fossil evidence for Darwin's stories for the gradual transformation of all life from protozoa and humans from an imaginary ape-like common ancestor has not materialized because neither of those stories actually happened? Charles Darwin was aware, and later paleontologists have long known, that fossils do not look like his story for life's diversity occurred. Now we know that accumulated fossil evidence also does not look like Darwin's story for human origins occurred. Was the Bible correct after all? Fossils look like the major groups of life forms appeared distinct at about the same time. And fossils look like humans are a special creation. Man when they appeared and did not evolve from an ape-like ancestor. In view of the excessive zeal to promote Darwin's stories for the last 150 years, contrary to available evidence, and the growing lack of consensus amongst experts, I've concluded that I am not a monkey's nephew.